has begun to make its move into some of the central institutions of French cultural, social, and intellectual life. And with the entry of this group into the salons, the salon ceases to be simply a place where one engages in social amusements and instead becomes a venue for the reading of new works, the transmission of news from correspondents elsewhere, and most importantly, for discussion. The entry of the philosophes into the salons is enabled, as Goodman argues, by a small number of aristocratic women who desired to continue their education in a society that provided very few opportunities for women to continue their education. Though barred from formal education, these women possessed substantial enough resources to organize and maintain weekly gatherings of intelligent individuals. The women who organized these institutions tended to come from the upper classes of society, but there were women whose lives had been marked by various sorts of family crises, bad marriages, and other sorts of disruptions. Their birth gave them access to wealth and to social prominence in some cases, but the misfortunes that they encountered tended to send them on paths that are otherwise not what might normally have been expected of them. Above all else, these seem to be women of considerable intelligence and with quite considerable organizational skills. The general name that's given to these people is they're called salonaires, people who organize salons. Now, a good many of the works that were published, the major works that were published during the Enlightenment had their debut in the salons. They were read before an audience that would then go on to discuss them. Some of the advantages of an arrangement like this sort should be reasonably obvious. It provides an arena where authors can try out ideas in advance of their publication. But other functions may be not so obvious. In a state that had rather limited venues for publication, and all of these venues were censored, the publication of works in the salon oftentimes was not the preparation for an eventual appearance of the work in print. It may have been the only publication that certain important works received at all. And indeed, certain of the great works of the Enlightenment, including many by Diderot, only seem to have appeared in the salons. And it was only after the Revolution that certain of these manuscripts that had initially been read in the salons begin their make their way into print. The women who ran the salons had a rather specific set of skills that were necessary to keep the institutions functioning. Beyond whatever organizational skills were required to make sure that the house in which a salon was going to be held was ready, that refreshments were available, that the right people were invited, the skills of a salonier included the ability to steer conversation to steer the conversation of the men who had been invited in ways that were to be productive. And notebooks that were used by these women indicate that they put a fair amount of thought into this. They asked questions, they thought about wh where the discussion would start, what points were to be drawn out, who they would turn to, um, how they would try to guide the discussion. The tributes which philosophes paid to Salinaires express at least some sense of this. One philosoph wrote of Julie de Lepinas, one of the great Salinaires, quote, she played the instrument, the instrument here being us, she played the instrument with an art that came of genius. She seemed to know what tone each string would yield before she touched it. I mean to say our minds and our natures were so well known to her that in order to bring them into play, she had but to say a word. Now, just as coffee houses were tied into a network of communications that reached beyond the individual coffee house and indeed embraced other parts of the world, so too the salon had contacts outside of the immediate circle. First of all, there was some leakage of works from the salon into the society at large. We might note that the fact that so many of the most famous works of the French Enlightenment originated in salons may explain certain features that these writings have, their cultivation of a witty style, their concern with striking formulations. All of this probably has something to do with the fact that these are works which, at least in certain of their earlier phases, came out of a world of witty conversation.
A second way in which the Salon interacted with the world around it can be traced to the activities of the Salonaire herself. It was among her responsibilities to maintain correspondence with interested parties outside of the Salon. And entering into correspondence, as Dina Goodman notes, involves certain assumptions on the part of both partners and certain responsibilities. Correspondents were supposed to write to one another regularly. They were supposed to report on news in the salon. They were supposed to bring news to the salon. The expectation when letters were written between the salons was that they would be read by others, indeed that they'd be read aloud at the salon and passed around to other circles, which would bring news to those circles of what was taking place in the salon. Finally, in time, the function of reporting on salons was passed on to others who began to serve as reporters. The most important figure here was Diderot's friend Friedrich Melchior Grimm, who lived from 1723 to 1807. He was a Bavarian who came to Paris as an ambassador and traveled frequently throughout Central Europe. He was the editor of a limited circulation newsletter called The Literary Correspondence. At its peak, it had maybe 15 subscribers, which carried news of what was taking place in the salon to the courts of Central Europe. Um, like someone who runs a financial newsletter today, Grimm charged quite a bit for his services and made a fairly decent living off of this. This was one of the places where certain of Diderot's works, which we'll be talking about in future lectures, appeared for the first time, although in a rather limited circulation, and had they not appeared in this newsletter, it's quite possible that they would be lost entirely to us. Here, then, in the Salon is an institution that plays a significant role in the circulation of new ideas. How significant a role is an open question, of course, but the role seemed to be significant enough to have drawn the fire of one of the most widely read writers of the 18th century. That writer was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and I want to say something about his critique now. In 1751, as I've mentioned, the Dijon Academy announces that the prize question for the next year would be, has the reestablishment of arts and sciences contributed to the improvement of our manners? Rousseau answered he won the prize, and with the discourse on the arts and sciences, he became a famous figure throughout Europe. There are two stories about how he came to write it. The best known is the one in Rousseau's own Confessions. In this, he says that he's on his way to visit Diderot, who during this period is briefly imprisoned uh, in, in Vincennes. On the way to visiting Diderot, he read the announcement of the prize contest. He collapses under a tree, struck by the question, and emerges a different man. The less well-known story comes from Diderot himself, who recalls that Rousseau showed up to visit him and was rather excited about the essay contest and was very eager to enter it. Diderot suggested to Rousseau, as Diderot's story goes, uh, that he respond in the negative. It would make his response stand out and hence would likely enhance his chance of winning. The two stories neatly point to crucial differences between these two men. Rousseau, allegedly, is the honest man plumbing the depths of his soul, speaking sincerely to his fellow readers, warning them that the arts and sciences are but flowers on the chains which will eventually bind them. Diderot is the witty, clever charmer, always ready to see things in a new light, to try a different angle, to put on a different persona. With so many voices in his dialogues, sometimes it's hard to figure out who's really talking. While the final break between these two men is still a few years off, and we'll have more to say about that in a later lecture, one can see, in retrospect, some of the origins of that break here. While Diderot was in his element in the play of wits that went on in the Salon, and would go on to produce works that reflected the sort of discussions that the Salon prompted, Rousseau was profoundly uncomfortable with this world. What bothered him, first of all, was what he saw as the superficiality of the salons, the affected language, the polished manners. All of this struck him as masks that hid men from one another. Secondly, there was the distinction between being and seeming, the difference between how one appeared and what one really is. The fact that these two had become separated from one another meant that there were now new forms of inequality that were possible since some people are better at manipulating appearances than others, and thus at exploiting this difference. 
Third, the world of the Salon is a world where martial virtues, the virtues that were associated in Rousseau's mind with the Republican form of government, had been weakened and they'd been replaced by other values, wittiness, cleverness. In the process, men became less manly and more like women. Finally, and most directly, the world of the Salon for Rousseau was a world ruled by opinion. And since, in Rousseau's mind, opinion is ruled by women, it is ultimately a world in which women rule over men. As he would write in his letter to D'Alembert on the theater, and it's this work that signals Rousseau's final break with his friend Diderot and with the Enlightenment itself. In this work, Rousseau writes, We have taken on entirely contrary ways, meanly devoted to the wills of the sex which we ought to protect and not serve. We have learned to despise it in obeying it and to insult it by our derisive attentions. And every woman in Paris gathers in her apartment a harem of men more womanish than she. Rousseau's complaints echoes the complaint that was raised about coffee, salons returning men into women. Dina Goodman suggests that in a sense, perhaps Rousseau was not entirely wrong. Among the things that was taking place in the Salon was a transformation in the way in which men interacted with each other, a transformation which required their submission to a woman who could do what they could not do, namely steer their conversation into some sort of a productive end. Left to themselves, they might not be able to do this. All they would be doing would be struggling to try to outdo one another. Thus, perhaps men did become less manly in the salons. But against Rousseau, it might be worth asking whether this was entirely a bad thing. So we've talked about two very different sorts of institutions today, the coffee house and the salon. The coffee house was something which was open to the world. It was something which you could go into and for a penny you could go down, drink your coffee, read your newspapers, and talk with your fellow Londoners. The Salon was a somewhat more aristocratic institution. Admission came to it through invitation. These are two more institutions of the European public sphere. There are some other ones left to talk about, though. There were also societies at this period, societies that met in secret, and we need to talk about that because there's a paradox here. Why would it be that an institution of what's allegedly a public sphere is an institution which takes place in secret? And finally, this is also an age which is mad for books. But some of the books that are circulating through the European public sphere during this period are books that have to get there through rather covert means. So in the next lecture, we'll be looking at secret societies and at the clandestine book trade. After listening to Lecture 6, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. Did the Crown ever try to shut down coffee houses? Let's listen to the professor's response. Well, indeed, there was a point where the Crown thought that the dangers of sedition from coffee houses were, were such that it would make sense just to shut them down. There are protests, and part of the enormous pamphlet literature in defense of coffee houses comes out of those protests, and rather quickly, they decide to let them remain open. And at least in part, there's a sense here that the crown discovers that two can play at this game, and that just as anti-monarchical ideas can circulate through the public sphere, through the coffee houses, well, also pro-monarchical ideas can circulate. This indeed may be a very effective way of generating support for the monarchy. So rather than silence the coffee houses, the monarchy decides it might be useful to figure out a way of taking advantage of them and using them. Another student then asked, why were coffee houses so appealing to the public? Let's listen to the professor's response. Well, one of the things that all of the discussions and all of the literature on coffee houses seem to suggest is that the great appeal of coffee houses were that they were cheap. First of all, you didn't wind up buying rounds for everyone else, which might happen if you went into an alehouse. Coffee was a hot drink, which meant you could take a long time to drink it, so you weren't quaffing it down with the uh, speed at which people drank ale. 
And if you factor into this also uh, the fact that you can read newspapers that you don't have to pay for in the coffee house makes these very cheap institutions. In fact, they have a name during this period. They're called penny universities. These are places where you can go and get an education just for the price of a cup of coffee. We do have reports of women in coffee houses. There are one interesting piece in, in the Tatler, I believe, that talks about coffee house beauties. And it's allegedly written by a woman. This is a period in which, of course, pseudonyms are used. People write in a number of voices. It's always unclear. As on the internet, you can't be clear if you're a dog. So too in the literature on coffee houses and the literature of the 18th century, it's rather unclear whether when women are, when articles allegedly written by women are read, whether these in fact were written by women. But nevertheless, there is an article there by a coffee house beauty, and the voice sounds very much like a very modern woman's voice. She's suggesting that men in coffee houses who are constantly praising the beauty of women are doing a disservice to them. They shouldn't just talk about their beauty. They should also recognize that women can think and talk to them as intelligent beings. It's a rather powerful statement. This ends Lecture 6. If you borrowed this course from a public library and would like your own copy of the course guide for future reference, call Recorded Books at 1-800-636-3399 and we'll send you a free copy. A shipping charge will apply. The Enlightenment, Lecture 7. The Emergence of the Public Sphere, Part 3. Secret Societies and the Clandestine Book Trade. Well, in this lecture, our tour of the European public sphere concludes with one of the more peculiar aspects of the public sphere, the fact that some of its most important institutions could only function in secret. And in fact, if you think about the journey we've been making, we began at perhaps the most public part of the public sphere with scientific academies, some of which were indeed even funded by the crown and thus by anyone's definition would be a public institution. We move from there to coffee houses, an institution which is open to the world, to anyone who can walk in from the street. We have moved from there to the world of the salon, a world that you entered by invitation. And now we come to certain institutions that met in secret and in certain activities which took place in secret. So we'll talk first about societies and secret societies and then move on to talk about the trade in forbidden books. Now, the Enlightenment was a remarkably sociable time. In fact, the Swiss historian Ulrich Imhoff has written a book about the Enlightenment in German, and the title is The Sociable Century. It had a myriad of societies that it created. Some were public, some were private. As we've already talked about, the Royal Society of London, the Lunar Society of Birmingham, these were groups of individuals that came together to pursue certain common interests. Coffee houses also served as regular meeting places for what were called, during this period, clubs. This was an English word, an English word that swept the continent and gatherings of this sort, whether in France or in Germany, were referred to as clubs. And in London, there were clubs of various sorts, literary clubs, gaming clubs, merchants clubs, medical clubs. One important club that met in London was something called the Club of Honest Whigs. It met during the 1770s on Thursday nights at a coffee house in London. Its membership included two people that we've talked about, Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Priestley. It also included another person that we'll talk about in a later lecture, Richard Price. And it included others who shared an allegiance to scientific inquiry, dissenting forms of religion, and Whig politics. The topics discussed at their meetings ran the gamut from the latest developments in electrical theory to the prospects for liberty in Corsica or in the New World. There were a lot of other clubs, including the famous Dilettante Society. This was supposed to be a club of people who'd been to Italy, but according to Walpole, it actually consisted of individuals who were interested in getting drunk. There was something called the Hellfire Club, which was a group of individual men who got together to act badly. There was something called the 150 Staunch Tories Club, which apparently was the opponent of the Honest Whigs. 
There is a club called the Molly's Club for men who like to dress like women, and the Ugly Club, which was a club for men who were ugly. Now, while many of these clubs took no particular interest in keeping themselves secret, there were other organizations, other sorts of societies in Europe, for whom secrecy was a paramount interest. And it's those societies that I want to talk about now. One particularly important example of a secret society is a society that met in Berlin on Wednesday nights. It was called the Wednesday Society, or at least that was its public name to the extent that it had a public name at all. It was founded in the autumn of 1783. It had at most 24 members. The, their meetings began at 6 in the evening. They ended with a dinner around 8. At these meetings, two members would make presentations, either in the form of a lecture or a brief statement of something to be discussed. The rules that we've found from this society indicate that they strictly excluded presentations in specialized areas such as theology or jurisprudence, because in those areas only a few individuals in the society might have any type of competence. What they were interested was in discussions about subjects which might be of interest to the general concerns of, quote, the enlightenment and the welfare of mankind. After the presentations in the Wednesday Society, the members would respond one by one according to the order in which they were seated. Members were allowed to speak a second time only after all of their colleagues had had a chance to comment. Minutes were taken at the meetings. Written copies of the lectures and minutes were available to the membership, although there was a secret code. Members were denoted only by numbers, not by names. Members were sworn to respect the opinions of their colleagues. They were supposed to treat one another as equals, so there could be no reference to titles or honors or social rank. Members were even forbidden to divulge the existence of the society, and they kept their secret fairly well. The first published discussion we have of the Wednesday Society dates from the 1890s. Now, why this obsession with secrecy? Why were these people so concerned about keeping the existence of this society a secret from the rest of Berlin? The reason, in part, may have something to do with the topics that were being addressed at the meetings. This was a society that had been organized for the purpose of discussing political and social questions, and so the topics that came up for discussion were such questions as the limits of censorship, possible reforms that might be made in the Prussian legal code, and whether indeed aristocratic privileges had any legitimacy at all. There was, however, an even more pressing reason for this society's obsession with secrecy, and that is that its members included some of the most prominent figures in Berlin's political and intellectual life. And a free and open discussion of opinions would be possible only if there was some type of assurance that they would be able to try out their ideas in a sympathetic setting before submitting them to scrutiny on a broader audience. And this was a society that had a rather distinguished roster of members. It included the two co-editors of the Berlin Monthly, who were regular participants. It included important figures in the Prussian Justice Department, people who were involved at this point in rewriting the Prussian legal code. It included individuals who were physicians to Frederick the Great. It also included a man who was to be the tutor of the crown prince. It also included a fair number of the most important Berlin clergy. And we'll have more to say about them in a minute. But these were individuals who had embraced a fairly enlightened approach to theology an approach that bore many resemblances to the deism that we talked about in an earlier lecture. They believed that the central tenets of Christian belief could be supported by rational arguments alone. They believed that there was no particular contradiction, hence, between faith and reason. And finally, members of the Wednesday Society included such major figures in Berlin literary and intellectual life as the publisher Friedrich Nikolai, of whom I'll have more to say in a later lecture, and the philosopher Moses Mendelssohn. Here then, shielded away from public view, was a remarkable group of individuals who met in secrecy as a way of doing what they could not do within the strictures of the Prussian bureaucracy. 
namely to step back from their work and assess what it contributed to advancing and improving the Enlightenment of Prussia. The society then brought together reformist elements within the state bureaucracy who were engaged in the process of modernizing and rationalizing the legal code. It brought together enlightened clergy. It brought together philosophers who, in company with various publishers, were trying to transmit useful knowledge to a new reading public. Now, while this was a group that met in secret, it was a group that had really unparalleled access to some of the most important public media in Berlin. Let's begin with the most obvious medium. It had the two editors of one of the major journals in Berlin, the Berlin Monthly. And a fair number of the articles that appeared in the Berlin Monthly had begun their life as papers that were read and discussed before the Wednesday Society and hence migrated out from this arena of secrecy into the public sphere proper. There's also another medium of communication that's worth recognizing here, and that is the medium of communication was available to the clerical members of the society. The clergy who were members of the society preached sermons every Sunday, and these sermons reached an even larger audience. And the sermons that they preached during this period, some of which wound up being subsequently published in the Berlin Monthly, had a particular interest in trying to show the moral and political implications of Christian doctrines. They were devoted to showing how a congregation should simply not be a good Christian, but also be a good and productive member of society. Finally, individuals like Nikolai and Mendelssohn were pioneers of a new style of philosophy, something that we call popular philosophy. It was focused on the task of cultivating civic virtues through a type of prose that could be readily understood by reasonable men. It rested on a conviction that philosophy was not an arcane science. It was something that should be of public interest. Hence, the Wednesday Society may have been a secret society, but its aims were avowedly publicly minded. Its goal, after all, was the enlightenment of its members and of the citizenry. And while the renown of its members made it something unusual, in its intentions it shared much with many other secret societies, including the Freemasons, and it's to that group that we'll now turn. The relationship between Freemasonry and the Enlightenment has been an object of intense interest since at least the end of the 18th century. The origins of the Masonic movement can be traced back probably to the middle of the 17th century, where certain guilds of stonemasons in, in England that had a shortage of members began to admit non-members as a way of generating income to fund the various services that these guilds provided to members and to their families. It's for that reason that the Masonic movement takes over many of the trappings of the old actual guilds of masons, or what in the jargon is called operative guilds, why in Masonic imagery you see trowels, aprons, building tools, and so on. These images were carried over into the new lodges, these non-operative lodges, lodges that weren't really out engaged in the exercise of actually building things. Also carried into the non-operative lodges was an emphasis on secrecy. And this stress on secrecy likely had its origins in some of the old operative guilds as a way of making sure that when guild members traveled from one area to another, they could identify themselves as actual practitioners of the Masonic art, as, as members of a guild. In 1717, the Grand Lodge of England was founded, bringing together four existing London lodges, the movement proved to be enormously successful and spread from England throughout Europe. As we mentioned in our discussion of the Treatise of the Three Impostors, there appears to have been a secret society that resembles in certain of its features the Masonic movement in Amsterdam even before the founding of the Grand Lodge in London. The Masons recruited a rather broad spectrum of members from aristocrats to artisans, and in some cases there seem to have been even auxiliary lodges of women masons. And by 1750, it's estimated that there were about 50,000 members in all the major cities of Europe. 
Now, there were a number of particular features that set the Masonic Lodges apart from other forms of association. First and most striking was their emphasis on secrecy, on rituals, and on grades of membership. Unlike the Wednesday Society, I think we have to say that secrecy is a constitutive element in the shaping of the Masonic societies. These are not societies that happen to be secret. These are not societies that are secret because there are certain good reasons, certain conditions that make them secret. Secrecy in the Masonic movement is a central constitutive element of the society. As the historian Margaret Jacob, who has done a great deal of research into the Masonic movement, suggests, the sharing of a common set of secrets is something that serves to create common ties between members who were different in almost every other respect. Thus, probably what is being kept secret matters much less here than the fact that all members share a common secret. A second distinctive feature of the Masonic movement is the hostility that it has towards the rest of the outside world, or as it's called in the language of the lodges, the profane. To be a Mason was to embrace a new form of life which is quite different from that form of life which is shared by those who still live in the profane world. Thirdly, this is an organization which is truly international in character. The organization of lodges from a central point in London assures a consistency from country to country in the language and the rituals and the ideals of the movement Masons who traveled from one lodge to another in Europe could experience in practice what was available only in theory to those who dreamed of a cosmopolitan republic of letters. Here, in other words, was a truly cosmopolitan community embracing all those who shared in the ideals of brotherhood and of enlightenment. Now, there's much literature on the connection between the Masonic movements the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. We'll have something to say about that in the lecture when we discuss the French Revolution. But what were the political implications of this movement? The statutes of lodges, after all, explicitly defined Freemasonry as having no politics. But as Margaret Jacobs suggests, what's probably meant here is a rejection of factional party politics. They reject politics, but what they embrace is the ideal of civility, of transforming themselves through acts of charity towards other brothers and reforming themselves in that way. Jacob also suggests that it's important to pay attention to the actual practices in which Masons were engaged. This was a movement that embraced many of the procedures of English constitutional government. They had elections they had representatives, they drew up constitutions. And this may explain why, in later decades, Masons were to play such an important part in various political movements in Europe. We might think that the practices that are learned in the lodges are sorts of practices which turn out to be useful in subsequent careers in the public sphere. Think about how many people go on to public life after having been Eagle Scouts. It's not that there's any type of intimate connection between the Boy Scouts and politics. It's just that being a Boy Scout may equip you with all sorts of skills that are turned out to be useful in public life. So too, this may be with the Masonic Lodges. They trained individuals in skills that were needed to engage in a new form of sociability. They met in the Lodge as individuals, not as members of a hierarchically ordered society. And the language on which the Freemasons drew combines politics, religion, and science. Now, one consequence of this is that lodges served as a way of spreading British political culture to the rest of Europe. The lodges allowed a chance for people to put into practice, to act out all sorts of ideas about constitutional politics that they could find in the texts from Enlightenment writers, that they could find in reports of what went on in England. But only in England were the lodges identical with the dominant political culture, a point that Jacob stresses rightly. And for this reason, perhaps, the lodges didn't seem particularly radical 
to the English. Everywhere else, though, they struck police authorities as quite strange and quite threatening. The emphasis on British politics was combined with an enthusiasm for new developments in science. The Lodges embraced Newton's notion of an orderly and harmonious cosmos. Some of this is reflected perhaps in the differing degrees of membership, the different ranks through which individuals moved. Also, as again Margaret Jacob suggests, the egalitarianism of the Lodges may have owed much to the leveling implications of scientific materialism. The Lodges were the place where members met, as it was said, on the level. And finally, the religious dimension of the ceremonies that took place within the Lodges may have owed much to Newtonian science. What was being invoked in the various Masonic ceremonies may well have been the deist's god, the architect of the universe, and the various ceremonies practiced in the Lodges, some of which um, were portrayed in Mozart's opera, Magic Flute. These ceremonies involve a passage from darkness to light. It symbolizes the experience of being enlightened. The emphasis here falls not on a unique insight into certain mysteries, but rather into an insight into the perfectibility of human beings and in the possibilities of brotherhood of all men. This, at any rate, was the ideal of the Masons. It was an ideal which many lodges, of course, didn't live up to, but it became one powerful medium for disseminating Enlightenment ideas throughout Europe. There was, of course, another way in which Enlightenment ideas traveled across Europe, and that was through books, and I want to talk about that now. The trade in books, and especially the trade in so-called forbidden books. Over the course of the 18th century, there's a dramatic change in the number and in the types of books available to readers, as well as a dramatic change in the way in which readers go about reading books. Two things, at least, seem to be reasonably clear. Over the course of the 18th century, a great many more books became available to readers than had been available at any previous date, and a shift in the character of the books available takes place. The sheer number of books may be attributed, in part, to a couple of factors. First of all, everywhere except in Paris, in France, there's been an erosion of the various arrangements which had placed limits on publication. The old guild structure, which had set limits on the number of individuals that could enter the book trade, was starting to break down. The number of publishers increased, and the aggressivity of publishers in seeking out connections with writers and developing various sorts of techniques for selling books. All of this increases the circulation of books throughout Europe. Second, there was an increased demand for books. The public was becoming more literate. They had more time to read books. And also, because of another change, they were developing a need to have a constant supply of new books. We'll talk about that in a minute. Equally significant in this period was a shift in the contents of the books. Every survey of patterns of publication suggests that by the 1870s, the demand for books in the area of literature and science had surpassed the demand for books in the area of religion. There were new genres which started appearing, such as the novel. They were avidly consumed and sometimes brought out in serialized form as a way of guaranteeing an audience for future publications. Running parallel to the explosion of books was a similar expansion in the periodical press, and this becomes the period where the modern newspaper starts appearing. The Spectator, for instance, was launched with a masthead that promised, quote, to be continued every day, thus expressing the idea that publications dealing with public matters should not be confined to periods of crises and don't have to take the form of pamphlets and broadsheets, but should come out on a daily basis. And thus, in a sense, the public sphere through these publications starts carrying out a constant surveillance of the actions of its rulers. Rulers, after all, had watched citizens for any number of years. Now we had citizens watching their rulers. The explosion of reading materials was accompanied by a transformation in the way in which books were read, and historians of the book describe this as a shift from what's called intensive to extensive reading. 
Intensive reading means this. Prior to the 18th century, it appears that most of the population owned and read very few books, and that the books that they owned, typically the Bible, were books that were read intensively, that is, over and over again. What begins to happen, at least for some groups, with the greater availability of books, is a shift in the pattern of reading. You start to have readers who read a number of books, and once they've read them, sometimes they don't need to reread them again, but they do need to go out and get new books. If this transformation in reading brings us to something closer to our experience of how we read books, there are other ways in which the 18th century may have remained closer to earlier patterns. It's not clear, for example, whether all readers read silently uh, or whether there were some readers who came to know their works largely because others read those works to them. It's easy to imagine that some individuals may have had enough literacy to get along with signs and broadsheets, but needed others to read more complex text to them. And finally, from what we noted when we are talking about coffee houses, it's clear that at least some works were being read socially rather than in isolation. And even if books were not being read socially in the sense that someone is reading out, say, material from newspapers from a pulpit in a coffee house, the relatively high cost of books and journals resulted in individuals clubbing together to purchase books as members of reading societies, which would circulate books and journals among their members. In response to this demand, there arose an international book trade, a book trade which, like many other global markets, winds up wrestling with, and in many cases, breaking down local barriers. Let's talk about some of the barriers. One barrier comes in the form of censorship. In almost all of Europe, governments censored books prior to publication, which meant that seditious, impious, or smutty material could not be circulated. A further barrier was posed by the persistence of old printers and booksellers' guilds, and they sought to maintain their privileges by restricting competition. Their aim was to keep profits up to sell expensive editions, perhaps to an aristocratic audience, without having to expand their publication or spend much time producing new books. One way to get around both of these barriers was to develop what, in effect, were two different international book markets. There were some books that traveled relatively freely from one part of Europe to another. And as an example here, we might think of Franklin's book on electricity, a book that was widely read, widely translated. But there was also a market for books that presented problems, either because they were pirated editions of books that had been circulating legally in the first market, for example, a pirate edition of Franklin. And others were books that, because of their seditious, impious, or simply smutty character, but we have to say that most 18th century books were never simply smutty, they may have been frequently smutty, seditious, and impious all at the same time. These were the books that caused problems. As the century wore on, it became clear that the technical capacities of the publishing industry had reached a point where it could overwhelm the censors. First problem with censorship is that somebody has to read all of this material, and sometimes it's hard to keep track of all of this. And also, the ingenuity of publishers in Holland and Switzerland had reached the point where they could figure out how to get even forbidden books across borders. One popular way of getting books across borders was an operation called marrying books. Books during this period were shipped unbound. So if you had a forbidden book, one of the ways to get it across a border was simply to interweave its pages, or in the jargon, marry it, to an improved book. The historian Robert Darton has come across a really priceless example of this. It's a case in which John Cleland's body classic Fanny Hill was married into the pages of the New Testament. Now, the underground book trade, like all trades, has its own peculiar jargon. And in that jargon, there was a special term used to refer to books that could potentially cause trouble. They were called, quote unquote, philosophical books. Now, some of these books were in fact what we would call philosophy. These books included works by authors such as Rousseau, Voltaire, uh, 
and other works that could not circulate freely because they had been banned by one or another of the authorities that had been given the power to ban books. But other books were not philosophical at all. They were either, on the one hand, political libels, which reported the latest scandals from Versailles, and a classic example of this genre was a book entitled The Anecdotes Regarding the Countess du Barry, a book which stakes out the relationship of sex and politics and explains how the allegedly impotent Louis XV had come to be dominated by the, his strumpet mistress du Barry, who treats him with utter contempt. She's unable to get any type of real sexual satisfaction in a world where dukes are utter impotence, so she goes trolling the servant quarters in a move that suggests to the readers of this that the only real men to be found in France are those who reside in the lower classes. An even more peculiar work is Teresa the Philosophe, on which Robert Darton has written a great deal. It's an outrageous combination of pornography and philosophy, which recounts the philosophical and sexual awakening of a young woman. It's one of those works that moves on a single page from explicit and frequently rather funny descriptions of sexual acts to metaphysical speculations on the relationship between mind and body, the role of free will, and the ultimate purpose of life. By the end of the book, Teresa has become a full-fledged philosopher, and she is able to sum up her teachings in a concluding passage which is entitled, The Summary of Everything Included in This Book. The summary is a truly curious mixture of materialism. She writes, the soul has no will and is only influenced by the sense. It has a bit of deism in it. There is a God, we should love him, for he is supremely good and a perfect being. There is no religion, for God is sufficient unto himself. And in the end, a certain type of moral conventionalism. She writes, the laws established in each region in order to bind society together should be respected. Teresa also teaches us that sex is a pretty good thing, especially if you can figure out how to not get pregnant because this, in the 18th century, is a great danger for women. It can be very dangerous for your health. Teresa also offers some tips for safe sex, 18th century style. What you need to find is a lover who's willing to read erotic books with you and engage in mutual masturbation, or, in the best of all cases, what you want is a lover who has the strength of will to pull out before ejaculating which is, of course, not a very safe form of sex. We've come a long way in a work like Teresa the Philosophe from the world of Locke, Newton, and even from the world of Voltaire, who had nothing but contempt for the dogs, as he put it, who churned out this sort of literature as a way of making a living. But somehow, an enlightenment that didn't have room for books like Teresa the Philosoph would be a much less fascinating place. In the next lectures, I want to move, though, from the literary underground, from this world of secret societies and illegal books, and examine how one individual managed to work through this world, this world of societies, of books, this world of salons, this world of coffee houses, and in the process produced some of the Enlightenment's most important and most innovative works. His name was Denis Diderot, and his story will occupy us for the next two lectures. After listening to Lecture 7, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. Was there pornography in the 18th century? Let's listen to the professor's response. Well, in some sense, there really isn't what we would consider pornographic literature or pornography in the 18th century. It's much more complicated and much better. The term that the 18th century uses to refer to this stuff is obscene or lascivious literature. That's distinguished from libertine or gallant or merely licentious literature. Writers who were associated, for example, with the High Enlightenment, take Diderot, for instance, produced works which were frankly and sometimes comically erotic. 
Uh, one of Diderot's early works is a book called The Indiscreet Jewels. It's a masterpiece, and it rests on a remarkably creative premise. Imagine that there's a magic ring that if you twist it, it gives women's sexual organs the power to speak. There's a man who has this ring, and he uses it. And what do women's sexual organs talk about? Well, among other things, when you turn the ring, they denounce the Asiatic despotism in which the story is supposed to be set. Though to any reader who's reading the book, it becomes pretty clear that the place that's supposedly Asia is in fact Paris. And when the jewels, as he puts it, need to discuss truly obscene matters, they start talking in Italian because according to Diderot, this is the proper language for being truly lascivious. Is this pornography? Is it philosophy? What is it? Well, it's a genre which sadly we've lost in this world. Well, to get the sorts of quote-unquote philosophical books involved a great deal of effort and a great deal of care. There were certain booksellers that would deal in them, others wouldn't. The books had to be shipped to you. Sometimes the custom was to ship invoices separately from the books themselves. These were the books that, as in the jargon of the trade, these are the books that could get you in trouble. So there were great efforts made to try to keep these books separate from regular book shipments. There were a lot of different censorship regulations in Europe, and um, to summarize quite brutally here, it differs very much from one area to another. England, you have guilds that have begun to lose their power by the end of the 17th century, and in 1695, something called the Licensing Act lapses, which effectively lifts censorship regulations and allows for a spread from printing from London to the rest of England. You can still get in trouble for printing books if they're particularly obscene. You can get sued by other authorities. The most famous case here is John Wilkes, a radical member of parliament who produces a rather smutty parody of uh, Alexander Pope's essay on man entitled An Essay on Woman. Prussia is another case where you have relative freedom of the press at least until 1786. The problem here is that when Frederick the Great comes to the throne in 1740, he finds himself confronted with a situation where censorship is distributed between many different departments. It's not very effective. His idea is to centralize all this in the Berlin Academy. The Berlin Academy, consisting of academicians, decides we don't want to do any more work. We don't want to read, read all these books. And so it's somewhat more tolerant here, largely by default, of what sorts of works can be published. Although, again, certain local authorities can censor other writers and can censor writers. This ends Lecture 7. The Enlightenment, Lecture 8, Diderot and the Encyclopedia. Denis Diderot has come to be seen as the most brilliant and inventive of the philosophes, he was the author of a number of works whose creativity and novelty still dazzle readers today. And he was also the driving force behind what was probably the Enlightenment's most ambitious project, the Great Encyclopedia, on which he labored from around 1751 to 1772. The scope of the man's talents are simply staggering. This is someone who moved between the high and the low Enlightenments. He wrote works on the sciences, that anticipated certain developments that really wouldn't come to fruition until long after his death. And he also wrote some of the more novel contributions to the genre of philosophical pornography. This was a man, in short, of many talents. And what I'd like to do in this lecture is say some things about his life, sketch out uh, certain of the projects that led him into the encyclopedia, and then discuss his 25 years struggle to produce this work. In the next lecture, what I'd like to do is talk about those remarkably innovative works that he wrote during this period, but didn't publish. So this lecture will be Diderot and the Encyclopedia. The next lecture will be what else Diderot was working on. He was born into a family of pious Catholics in a, in a small town in France in 1713. His father was an artisan, someone who made surgical implements. 
They enrolled him in seminary in Paris. There may have been actual plans for him to become a priest, but he rather quickly abandoned these plans, secretly married, and set out on a career as a man of letters, attempting to try to make a living in Paris by writing. Now, he's, he's doing this at the very moment when it's possible, because of developments in the French publishing industry, for someone actually to be able to make a living writing, uh, especially someone with Diderot's talents. And those talents include certain abilities at translating works from English into French. This is a really useful skill at this point, because as I've suggested in other lectures, English works are the really interesting works during this period. The scientific works of Newton, the psychological writings of John Locke, the theological speculations of various deists. These are things that fascinate Europeans, and Europeans tended to read French, but not English. So Diderot could make possibly a pretty good living as a translator. His first important publication were his own philosophical thoughts. The title is of 1746. It's a collection of short aphorisms. He publishes them anonymously without the approval of the censor. They are a unrelenting critique of religious dogma. Take one example. Quote, the thought that there is no God has never frightened anyone, but rather the thought that there is one and such a God as has been described to me that is frightening. This book is deemed seditious enough, irreligious enough, that the Parliament of Paris, this judicial body, states that the book, quote, presents to the restless and reckless spirits the venom of the most criminal and absurd opinions that the depravity of human reason is capable of. And so they declare that the book should be torn up and burned by the high executioner. The book is followed by further attacks on religion, which in turn lead to the denunciation of Diderot to the police as, quote, a very dangerous man who speaks of the holy mysteries of our religion with contempt. The origins of the Great Encyclopedia Project can be traced to 1745, when two writers sign a contract with a Parisian publisher to translate into French an English reference work uh, Ephraim Chambers' Cyclopedia from 1727, published in 1727 in English. Over the next several years, this project bounces between a number of different printers and booksellers. Editors are replaced. Plans for the translation gradually evolve into something more ambitious, namely the idea that what you need is a revised and, and improved Chambers' Cyclopedia. And finally, with the hiring of Diderot and his great collaborator, the mathematician uh, Jean-Laurent d'Alembert, as co-editors in October of 1747, they've now settled on a project of doing a completely new reference work. And as it turns out, this is a reference work which has an agenda. The agenda is going to be to try to provide useful knowledge. And in the process of providing useful knowledge, you're going to be banishing obscurantism and superstition. They circulate a uh, prospectus in 1747. They solicit subscribers for the work before they begin actually producing it. And this, as we'll see, turns out to be crucial for the survival of the work. The initial plan is for a work of about eight volumes of text. It's going to include two volumes of plates. And in 1747, they promise that those that put up their money to buy this work are going to get their completed volumes of the encyclopedia by December of 1754. The first volume appears more or less on schedule in 1751, but things rather quickly get out of hand, and it's not until 1772, 18 years after the promised completion date, that subscribers get their final volume. And the work that they get turns out to be 18 volumes longer than the work that they signed up for, which means it's going to be three times as costly to them as uh, the work that they subscribed to in 1747. Now, bringing this work to completion is really one of the great struggles of Diderot's life, and it's made all the harder by various collisions with authorities in France. On July 24th, 1749, two police officers show up at his apartment. They are armed with a blank bill of arrest, which allows them to arrest anyone they want and detain them for an unspecified time for an unspecified charge. 
Diderot is taken off to prison. He's placed in solitary confinement, and his manuscripts are seized. Among the manuscripts which are seized are the various works he's been writing during this period, including Letter on the Blind, which has certain types of speculations about what a blind person could uh, could understand, what sorts of ideas they could have. There seems to be, in, in this work, there is some theological speculations about um, if you can't have any type of perception of God, how can you indeed know that God exists? Diderot tries the strategy for several weeks of simply denying that he was the author of the works that the police charge him with writing. After all, these are works that are published anonymously. But in the end, he finally confesses. And then he's allowed to do some work. He, after all, has been hired by publishers to complete the encyclopedia. They are the people who, in effect, own the rights for the book. Diderot is their employee in some sense. And the publishers are very interested in seeing that he gets the encyclopedia done. So he manages to do a fair amount of work while he's in prison. It's not like this is a terrible dungeon. He has a room where he can continue to do his work, his writing on the encyclopedia. And indeed, He's even allowed to have visitors. The famous visit between Rousseau and Diderot takes place while he's in prison here in Vincennes. And finally, on November 3rd, he's freed. Between 1751 and 1757, volumes of the encyclopedia appear at something close to 12-month intervals. They're delayed by certain difficulties in producing the text. This is an ambitious project. It's hard to get writers to deliver the articles on time. And at least once in 1752, after the first two volumes have come out, the publication is suppressed under a royal edict. But then the work continues to start up again. In 1757, we come to a rather crucial problem, however. And that is, we're now at the, it's been coming out in order, and now we're up to the volume that contains uh, an essay by D'Alembert on Geneva, the city of Geneva. And in this, D'Alembert praises the city of Geneva, talks about how enlightened its clergy are, and says that these clergy are virtually deists. He only has one complaint about the city, and that is that it doesn't have a theater. He's put this in the article at the urging of Voltaire, who after all has a chateau near Geneva and would like to see some of his plays produced, so he needs to have a theater in in Geneva. The article generates controversy from two sides. First of all, the Genevan clergy are not happy that the world is being told that they are virtually deists. They assume they're Calvinists, so they're quite outraged at this. And more seriously for the project, Rousseau um, attacks this same article in the next year for this, for this suggestion about having a theater, writes his letter to D'Alembert on the theater, and it's this work that signals his break with the Enlightenment. D'Alembert tired of all these controversies involved in the project, uh, resigns, leaving Diderot to carry on alone. There are mounting controversies that are caused with the appearance of each successive volume. And finally, it looks like the project is dead in 1759 when we have a revocation of the privilege to publish this work. We nevertheless are left with a legal problem and that is that the subscribers have paid for a volume. They've subscribed to a volume. They want this impressive uh, work that they've been promised. They only have a certain number of volumes of this. They want a completed encyclopedia. This translates into an argument that they have certain property rights. They've invested something in this work, the subscribers, and they want that property right honored. So we have a clash between the interests of the subscribers and the interest of the monarchy in trying to protect public morals by suppressing this work. And a compromise is reached. And the compromise is this, that the problem seems to be the fact that it's coming out volume by volume. By coming out volume by volume, a volume appears. There's controversy about that volume. It starts to die down. Another volume comes out. That produces yet more controversy. So the solution is that Diderot is going to work on the remaining volumes and bring them out all at once in one batch. And at that point, there is a promise that the book will not be printed again. The last 10 volumes of the text are put together then somewhat less carefully than the first seven. They're delivered finally at the end of 1765. 
and the magnificent plates that accompany the encyclopedia, which are really one of the great achievements of 18th century engraving, these follow over the next seven years. Now, the distribution of the final volumes of the encyclopedia to its subscribers, as Robert Darton has shown in a, in a wonderful book on the publishing history of the encyclopedia, this is, this is really only the beginning of the book's history. The first edition is limited to 4,000 very expensive sets. This is the sort of project that Parisian publishers like to produce, a, a very luxurious work for an audience of considerable means. Subsequent reprint editions and pirate editions come out from other publishers. These are priced far more cheaply and they get the work to a much wider audience. So while the first edition consists of only 4,000 sets, by the 1780s with these various pirate editions, reprint editions, these editions which are, are basically something which is coming out of the forbidden book trade that we talked about or the clandestine book trade that we talked about in a previous lecture, um, by the 1780s there are now some 20,000 sets in circulation. Now, there are two ways of thinking about the encyclopedia, and um, the, the historian John Law has talked about this as being a contrast between thinking about it being, on the one hand, a reference work, and on the other hand, being what Diderot was fond of calling this, a machine de guerre, uh, a weapon of war. It is one of the greatest of a series of reference works that begin to appear in the 17th and 18th centuries. They are driven by a notion of spreading useful knowledge. These reference works, beginning with, say, Chambers's uh, Encyclopedia of 1728, are put together by collaborators. The notion is that no one individual can understand everything, so you need to have collaborators working on, on a collective work of reference. So you have the Chambers Cyclopedia of 1728, which really perhaps inaugurates this period. There are, uh, there's a Jesuit dictionary that's begun in 1704, or even earlier in French, and has um, reached its sixth edition of some seven volumes by 1752. And the Encyclopedia Britannica, the famous Encyclopedia Britannica, makes its first appearance towards the latter part of the century in 1768 to 1771. Now, as a reference work, the Diderot's Encyclopedia has its oddities. First of all, there is sometimes a careless repetition of articles, as if Diderot has lost track of what's in here. So you can find uh, articles on both political arithmetic and arithmetic, comma, political. There's also a, a shifting amount of attention, depending upon who the collaborators are, to certain types of topics. For instance, at one point, there's a man who's the founder of various veterinary colleges in France who works on the Encyclopedia Project for a few years. And during the period when he's collaborating with Diderot, you get an awful lot of articles on horses and horse ailments. There's not a real history of philosophy in the book, but if you look at four articles, an article on Aristotelianism, an article on Cartesianism, an article on Hobbesism, Hobbes's philosophy, and an article on Locke, you can sort of piece together a history of philosophy. And sometimes, if you want to know about people, you have to know where they were born, because biographies of people sometimes turn up under the articles on particular places. But it's not simply a reference work. It's also a work that's designed to advance a program. It is a weapon of war, which Diderot and his fellow workers are putting into action against all the obscurantism of the past. It renounced appeals to tradition, it denounces ignorance and superstition, and it proclaims on almost every page that man, active, productive, scientific, knowing man, is going to be the measure of all things. So. It's thus an attempt, perhaps, to summarize all of the enlightenment that has come to pass so far in France, thanks to the arts and sciences, as well as an attack on all the darkness that still remains to be routed in contemporary France. Now, perhaps the best way to get a sense of, of the work is to look at two attempts to summarize what's going on in it. One of them is a preliminary discourse that D'Alembert writes to Volume 1, which incorporates in part uh, 
the original prospectus that Diderot had written in 1750. This appears in the first volume and sort of lays out what the encyclopedia is going to do. Another thing to look at is an article which Diderot writes in the encyclopedia itself. The entry is the entry on encyclopedia, where he explains what the encyclopedia is. And why don't I talk about both of these in, in sequence? In D'Alembert's preliminary discourse, he begins by paying homage to the dual title that the work has. The full title, to give it for once, is the Encyclopedia, or a Systematic Dictionary of the Arts and Sciences. Now, as an encyclopedia, what you're trying to do is provide a general ordering of human knowledge, and you're trying to show the interrelationship between various fields. The word encyclopedia itself comes from the Greek, cyclos paideia, the, the circle of knowledge. It's supposed to be some type of unitary presentation of human knowledge. As a systematic dictionary of the arts and sciences, it has to provide something more than general principles. It's also supposed to offer some type of insight into the essential details of the mechanical and the liberal arts, as they're called during this period. D'Alembert's preliminary discourse tries to address that first function by laying out a genealogy of knowledge that relates the various branches of human knowledge and shows how they're interrelated by going back to the origin and formation of ideas. And in this tree of knowledge that D'Alembert constructs, and the tree itself is this rather complicated chart that folds out on the pages of the encyclopedia. This is a chart that, when you fold it out, it's as large as four of these massive pages of the encyclopedia. In this tree of knowledge, all knowledge is seen as being derived either from sensation or from reflection. This is the great distinction, which is in Locke's book on human understanding, and in a previous lecture we talked about how John Toland had used this indeed as his starting point in Christianity Not Mysterious. D'Alembert gives uh, pride of place to sensation, since it's only sensation which provides us with any new insights. It's only sense data, things that we can see, things that we can experience. Reflection, in D'Alembert's view, seems to provide us with very little. And in part, what he's rejecting here is the notion that there are any type of innate ideas that uh, we can access simply by reflecting on the contents of our own mind, independent of actual sense data, independent of actual sensation. Now, according to D'Alembert, it's from our sensations that we gain, first of all, knowledge of our existence, second of all, knowledge of the external world, thirdly, knowledge of others. It's also from sensation that we are supposed to get notions of wrong, good, and evil, although moral philosophy, the notion of virtue, it seems to be, in his view, a reflective type of knowledge that arises from our thinking about uh, our experiences of good and evil, our sensations of good and evil. And finally, what we also get by sensation, he claims, is knowledge of ourselves as being a compound of both mind and body. And our reflective knowledge of God seems to arise from, from uh, working on this direct sensation that we seem to have our, of ourselves as both having a body and having a mind. This dualism, as we'll see in the next lecture, is something that Diderot has problems with. And one of Diderot's wittiest dialogues, D'Alembert's Dream, is in effect an attack on this conviction of his collaborator that we are mind and body, this basic Cartesian dualism. From here, D'Alembert goes on to proceed to organize all the different varieties of knowledge that can be produced from combinations of direct and reflected knowledge. And there are three broad categories of human understanding that you get when you mix direct and reflected knowledge. These three are memory, the collection, the simple passive and almost mechanical collection of direct knowledge. Uh, secondly, you get reason, which is reflection applied to things that we've observed. You see something and then you think about it. And finally, imagination, which is reflection applied to objects that are already created by the mind. And corresponding to these three faculties of memory, reason, and imagination are the three general divisions of knowledge, namely history, philosophy, and the fine arts.
the richest and most productive of the divisions of knowledge is, not surprisingly, that central category, philosophy, which divides itself broadly into the categories of knowledge of man and knowledge of nature. And this provides us with most of the knowledge that matters for d'Alembert. This is what counts in d'Alembert's system. Now, in the end, the lesson that d'Alembert seems to be drawing from this rather laborious process of collecting this, uh, tracing this genealogy of knowledge, is that historically, too much of the time, human beings have been thinking about the wrong sorts of things. When we apply reflection to itself, when we separate reflection from any contact with sense experience, this produces various phantoms in the brain and in the most dangerous form, it gives rise to religious fanaticism and religious enthusiasm. But reason, reason, which for d'Alembert means a critical reflection on sensory experience, this critical reflection on sense data is what brings forth those various fruits which, as uh, Francis Bacon promised, is going to make mankind flourish. Now, this also has some implications for how the encyclopedia is going to have to be produced. It's not enough to read some books about subjects. This is what Chambers did when he produced his encyclopedia, after all. Went out and read books, summarized what, uh, what books other people had written. You also need to have, obviously, direct experience. What this means is that you need to have a team of experts who can write articles, some sort of collaboration between men of letters and scientists. And also, most importantly, what you need to do is to go out into the workshops where people, are, where artisans are actually doing things that change the world and talk to these individuals who are actively engaged in the processes of technical production and try to see how it is that they are applying their reflection to sense data and producing results which make the world better. Now, there's one thing that the elaborate tree of knowledge can't do, and that is it can't provide the plan of organization which is going to be carried out in the pages that follow. Because after all, the encyclopedia is, as it's also advertised, a systematic dictionary. And that means that the ordering of articles in the encyclopedia, that ordering is not going to be able to follow this pattern of different types of knowledge, it's going to have to follow the pattern of the rather arbitrary order of letters in the alphabet. So we go from A to B to C to D to E. And when the E volume appears, we come across another article about how the encyclopedia works, namely Diderot's article on encyclopedia itself. And it's that article that I want to talk about now. Now, as I've already suggested, the encyclopedia is a work that's not free from repetitions. And some of the material in Diderot's article, Encyclopedia, repeats arguments from the preliminary discourse. As I've already suggested, the encyclopedia is not free from repetitions. And some of the material that you find in Diderot's article, Encyclopedia, some of this material repeats arguments from d'Alembert's preliminary discourse. But that's hardly surprising since D'Alembert's preliminary discourse itself reprints or repeats parts of Diderot's initial prospectus to subscribers. There's a lot of borrowing back and forth here, in other words. Diderot shares with his co-editor a general sense of the defining character of his age. The age is, he writes, a philosophical century, a reasoning age. It's an age which is marked by the intellectual courage to examine all things, to look at them anew, and not to flinch from the recognition of how many of our institutions owe their origins to accidents and how much of our knowledge really remains in its infancy. There's a yoke of authority and tradition, and that yoke has, in some sense, yet to be shaken off. Now, as Diderot understands his age, it's an age of philosophers, of philosophes. In other words, it's not an age of geniuses. The 17th century, according to Diderot, that was the age of geniuses. These were people who, whose minds obeyed no rules, who were followed no sort of pre-established patterns, and as a result, they had insights that reached far beyond anything that could be achieved during their times by other individuals. We can think, perhaps, of Isaac Newton. Yet, 
a genius, because a genius follows no rules, has no way of progressing beyond the area where this genius has had success. Think perhaps of Newton's later life in which he spends much of his time enmeshed in questions of theology with, with not terribly productive results. The task of the current century, as Diderot understood, was to set down rules which would allow ordinary human understanding to push beyond the achievements of the geniuses of the 17th century. And obviously he sees the encyclopedia as playing a central role in pushing forward that effort. There are, after all, limits on what individuals can achieve. Hence, what you need to have is the sort of collaborative and collective work that the encyclopedia represents. And even more fundamentally, Diderot makes a distinction between what he calls inventors and what he calls writers of texts. Inventors, obviously, are engaged in the, in the process of discovery. And since they're engaged in this process, they are not typically going to be the readers of books, nor are they people who could find that much that's going to be of use in the transactions of the various scientific academies. The individuals who are characterized by Diderot as writers of text, on the other hand, these are individuals who don't make discoveries, but they do know how to make available to a broader public the insights that inventors have achieved. And so the task of writers of texts, and these writers of texts are what Diderot seems to understand as being the central task of a philosoph, of a philosopher, as he understands it. These writers of texts have as their mission, quote, to bring past discoveries together and reduce them to an ordered scheme so that more men may be enlightened and that each may contribute within the limits of his capacity to the intellectual progress of his age. These writers of texts, in other words, don't perform experiments, but they do know how to disseminate knowledge around them. And for that reason, they can make significant contributions through this work on the encyclopedia. The encyclopedia then is a project that's linked rather closely to its time. It's a project who, whose completion has to be accomplished within a certain period of time um, if it takes too long, and one wonders whether at certain points during this long struggle Diderot might have wondered whether it was taking much too long. If it takes too long, some of the knowledge in it is going to be out of date by the time that the work is completed. And also there's a necessity of completing the work for a more troubling reason. It could possibly serve as a way, once finished, of protecting human knowledge from future catastrophes. And this then seems to be the sense of how Diderot sees history that emerges from this essay. It's a succession of ages of enlightenment and ages of obscurantism. The hope of the encyclopedia thus is to put an end to one age of obscurantism and perhaps to serve as a means of protection during future ages of obscurantism. Now, Diderot's account of how the encyclopedia is going to be organized differs somewhat from d'Alembert's account in the preliminary discourse. He sees two general strategies by which you could organize knowledge. One path leads from the general to the particular. It begins, for instance, with the idea of the universe, an idea of the universe that's contained in the mind of God, and then proceeds to move downward until it encompasses all lesser beings. The other path is the path which takes an ascent, which takes its starting point from those things which are bound up with the human condition, from those activities, which are the activities in which human beings engage. Not surprisingly, Diderot favors the second approach. The first approach, that approach which starts with the mind of God and proceeds downwards, he says that even if you could do that successfully, it would remain hopelessly obscure. To attempt to understand the way in which the universe is organized is going to be much more difficult than simply to try to observe nature directly. The preferred strategy for Diderot, instead, is to place human beings at the center of the account, to take human activity and creativity as the basic starting point, and then to see this history of arts and crafts as a history of nature put to use. <laughs> 
And this is perhaps nowhere more evident than in the magnificent plates that accompany the encyclopedia. The French literary critic Roland Barthes has written a wonderful article on the plates of the encyclopedia. On many of these pages, what one finds, in addition to rather detailed, indeed even meticulously detailed images of various mechanical devices, what you also find is a picture of the workshops in which these devices are being put to use. Thus, when you leaf through these pages, you're constantly coming across images of human beings at work, human beings transforming the world, human beings mastering nature, engaged in unceasing activity. There remains, finally, the problem of how you're going to organize all this material, how it's going to be coordinated. Since the order of presentation, as is obvious from the way in which we've gotten to the article on encyclopedia, is going to be alphabetical. It's not going to be scientific or epistemological. How are you going to tie this whole web together? Well, Diderot placed a great deal of hope and was very excited about the notion of using cross-referencing. At the end of articles, there are terms which are supposed to clarify the subject, which are supposed to indicate its connection to other subjects to which that subject might be related. And sometimes uh, these cross-references point to theories that could be contrasted with the account you've just read. Diderot also indicates that there are other cross-references that are supposed to be slightly subversive, or as he puts it, satirical or epigrammatic, and they subtly criticize concepts or terms just discussed by these ironic juxtapositions of one text with another. In a sense, Diderot's article on the encyclopedia uh, accomplishes the same feat with reference to the preliminary discourse that d'Alembert has written. For if the preliminary discourse gives us a God's eye view of all human knowledge with all the disciplines neatly assigned to their various positions as you go down this, this massive chart, what Diderot offers is a rather different way of tying knowledge together. You browse through the encyclopedia, moving from article to article, not in alphabetical order, but by landing in one place, picking up a connection, picking up a cross-reference, moving, as it were, through a maze. You're never entirely able to lift yourself up out of the world in which you're engaged and look at the whole thing. But nevertheless, you're always moving from one new insight to another, learning new sorts of things. And in that sense, more than anything else, browsing through the pages of the encyclopedia is a strikingly modern experience. You almost get the sense that what Diderot really would have wanted here would be the World Wide Web, or what Diderot would have loved would be links and hypertext. And indeed, I think if, you, if there was one 18th century thinker who would have known how to make use of the modern computer, it would have been Diderot. And indeed, as we'll see in the next lecture, in some of the works that Diderot didn't publish, some of the works which Diderot was working on during this period, but which he left unpublished, he seems to be moving into speculations that in certain ways anticipate many of the modern developments uh, in information theory and in artificial intelligence and in evolutionary biology. This ends Lecture 8, The Enlightenment. Lecture 9, Dreaming Philosophers and Crazy Musicians, Diderot's Later Career. In the last lecture, we talked about Diderot's labors on behalf of the encyclopedia. In this lecture, what I want to talk about is Diderot's literary activity after the 1759 suppression of the encyclopedia and his activity here really falls rather neatly into two parts. First of all, under the terms of that agreement, which I talked about in the last lecture, he has to satisfy the property rights of those who had subscribed to the encyclopedia, and he continues to work to turn out the last volumes of the work and get the plates out to the subscribers and thereby satisfy what they've contracted to receive. But at the same time, Diderot also manages to produce a number of works on his own. Curiously, he makes no efforts to have these works published. Um, it's possible that under the condition of uh, the terms of his release uh, from his 1749 imprisonment, he may have agreed with authorities that he would never publish 
articles critical of religion or, or of morality, and this was part of the terms by which he was released. It's also possible that he simply became more careful after his experience with the encyclopedia, and out of a desire to get this great work finished and published, he may have been willing to sacrifice his own literary ambitions and thus didn't want to call attention to himself, didn't want to cause yet more controversy. Either way, from the 1760s onward, Diderot is producing a series of brilliant and challenging works that are only going to become known after his death in 1784, and indeed in some cases long after 1784.